Welcome to this video, great to have you here. This video here is a collection of my extremely comprehensive React course I offer on Udemy. A link to the course of course can be found in the video description with a nice discount. This course on Udemy is an extremely deep diving React course starting at the basics and then moving through all the core topics like React Router, Redux, Animations, Authentication and much more. In this video here, I give you a very extensive sneak peek into the course covering the entire first and second module of my React course. I hope you enjoy it and I hope you learn a lot about React. Obviously it would be great to also welcome you in the Udemy course if you like this. Welcome to this course about React. It's great to have you on board. My name is Maximilian Schwarzmüller and I'm a freelance web developer and React developer. I worked with React a lot and I can tell you it's an amazing library for creating highly reactive and super fast JavaScript driven web applications. The JavaScript driven part is especially important because since React is a JavaScript library, it's of course about writing your web apps in JavaScript. And that in turn is amazing because since JavaScript runs in the browser, it allows you to create super fast web apps that feel like mobile apps. Users don't have to wait for page reloads. Now React is probably the most popular JavaScript library you can learn these days and for a good reason. You will learn all of its core features throughout this course and way more than that. You will learn what React is about, how it works and why you might want to use it. You will learn how to build components with React, how to use Redux for better state management, how to use the React router and you'll not just learn this in simple projects or theory. No, we will build an entire React application throughout this course the Burger Builder, which is an amazing application utilizing all the concepts you learn in this course so that you have a really solid understanding of all the concepts taught throughout this course. By the end of the course, you'll therefore have way more than just a solid understanding of React and you'll be able to dive deeper into more challenging projects and apply for React developer jobs or become a React developer as a freelancer, whatever your goal is. So let's get started with React. What, why, and how? Let's start with the what is React question. And let me cite a phrase from the official React page. React is a JavaScript library for building user interfaces. Now that's a nice sentence, but what does it mean? The first important part is the JavaScript library part. It is a JavaScript library. It is about building JavaScript driven apps. React apps run in the browser. They don't run on the server, they run in the browser. And that gives us a great advantage. Things happen instantly since they happen in the user's browser. We don't have to wait for a server response to get a new page or to render something new. The other important part in that sentence is the user interfaces part. User interfaces are basically what the user sees. And React is all about using components for building these. If you think about it, you can split up any web page into components. Here's an example. This is just any random web page we can think of. We might have this header area, a sidebar, and then on the right some content. Now we clearly can split this up into components. We would have a header component, a sidebar component, and then a headline and an article content component. Now why is thinking like this important or useful? Because if we split up our web app, our website into such components, we can build these building blocks, these components as contained pieces of code. We don't have to build our entire web page as one bigger picture. We can build all these tiny things on their own. This of course makes working in teams easier, but even if we're working alone, it makes it easy for us to keep our code manageable. If we change the headline later on, we only have to go into that component and update it and we don't have to find that code on our entire web page code. We also can easily reuse components then. If we have a list item component and we want to output a list of these, well, list items, 
then we only have to write the code once and can then easily reuse it. Because, and that's important, React components can be thought of as custom HTML elements. In the end, you're just writing custom HTML elements. This is what React is about. And it therefore solves the problem of having to build complex user interfaces with what HTML and JavaScript gives you by writing maintainable, manageable, and reusable pieces of that code, which you then can throw into your web app wherever you need to use it. Let's have a look at some examples. So in the last lecture, I explained that React is all about components and that components are awesome. Let's actually see this on a real web page. Here's react.js.org, which is the official web page of the React team. And if we have a look at it, it is actually built with React, of course. This looks like a normal web page, and it is, of course, but we can split this up into components. We got this header component, and in there we got these single navigation item components. We got this starting image call to action component here, and we got all our elements down here where they advertise React and what it is about. We see more components here, like these image code snippet components here with some descriptions to the left of it. All these things are basically building blocks, which we can of course easily consider as reusable pieces. And actually they are reusing this element here. We got one element here and then the same element with different content being used below it. Now, of course, you can hard code all that with just HTML, JavaScript and CSS, but then you will have to repeat your code over and over again. Here with components, you build your own HTML element, so to say, and then you just reuse that element. And behind the scenes, this HTML element has all this content already inside of it. And we'll see this in detail in a second. Another good example would be Udemy. Here on the Udemy page where I searched for Vue.js, an alternative to React. There we see we get a lot of components too. We got the whole header with the search bar component. Then we got the search result summary component here where it also allows us to filter the search results. And then the search res results themselves. We got reused list item components here. Each of them has an image and a different title, but in the core, they all are the same. They all have the same structure. And Udemy also uses a JavaScript framework to achieve this and to have an easier time developing and, and that's important, maintaining and updating this page. So this is why components are awesome and why we as a developer probably want to use components. And that is why React is all about components. Now that we know what React actually is, it's time to get our hands dirty. And for that, I visit codepen.io. That is like a web editor, which allows us to write very simple HTML, CSS, and JavaScript apps, or really more like a playground. We won't really use that to build real projects. In this course, we will use a local setup for that. But it is great to dive into React. So on codepen.io, you can click on create and create a so-called pen. That is simply a workspace where you can write HTML, CSS, and JavaScript code. Now in this editor, you got three areas for HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. And now let's write a very simple application, a demo, to see how we write something with normal HTML, JavaScript, and so on, and how we then add React to maybe have an easier time creating such an application. For that, in the HTML part of this editor, I'll create a new div. And you can quickly create this by typing div and hitting tab. This will automatically expand this. And in there, I will now add a h1 tag and simply output max, my name, and below that a paragraph where I say your age 28. This is my age. And of course, feel free to use your data here. So this now leads to the output below. It updates automatically. Now let's quickly give this some styling. Let's simply give this div maybe a class of, let's say person, the name is up to you, and add this person CSS class with some normal CSS code where I simply give this, let's say a border, one pixel solid and this gray. 
with CCC and a box shadow of zero, two pixels, two pixels and let's say the same gray. Let's maybe lose a, uh, use a slightly brighter one here, EEE -E -E for the border. Let's now also give this a width of let's say 200 pixels and a padding of 20 pixels. And now we have this card like look you see below there. Now that is such a person card information, holding information about a person, let's say. We can also set this to display inline block and give it a margin of 10 pixels because now what I can do is I can of course replicate this and add a second person. Let's say menu who has an age of 29. That's my colleague. So now we got these two person cards and you could easily think of this as a normal web application where you output some information about users or about the team behind your, your blog you're creating, something like that. And we're using only HTML and CSS here. Now we can already see one limitation kind of. We're always reusing the same HTML code here. Now that isn't too problematic here. It would be more problematic if we would do something with each of these snippets with JavaScript even. But even without that, we can think of this part here as a component. This person div always is structured in the same way, just the data inside of it varies. This is where React comes in, though React shines the most as we connect this to JavaScript logic too. But still, we can already use React to create reusable components here. For that, let's add React. I'm going to shrink this CSS part a tiny bit and in the JavaScript area, I first of all have to import React. You can click on that gear icon next to JavaScript and then you can download or import some external JavaScript libraries. And React is such an external library. Actually, it's so popular that on CodePen, you can go to the quick add dropdown and simply scroll to React and this will add it. Now here it adds version 15.6.1, might differ at the point of time you're viewing this. In this course, I will cover version 16, so you're learning the latest React and then the local setup we'll use in this course will also use that latest React version, no worries. Here, however, we're using an older one, but for the demo here, this does not matter at all. We also need to quick add React DOM. That is another package from the React team React itself kind of is the logic we need for creating these React components. I told you that React is all about components. React DOM is then about rendering these components to the real DOM. With these two packages added, we're almost there, but React uses a special JavaScript syntax and a lot of next generation JavaScript features. I'll come back to this later in the course. I'll have a whole module where I introduce you to the most important next-gen features React uses. So to unlock the usage of these features and this special syntax, in the JavaScript preprocessor dropdown, you have to choose Babel. That simply is a tool which compiles the next-generation JavaScript code you're writing here to code that runs fine in the browser so that we write code with all features we want, but ship code that works in the browser. And with that, you can click save and close. And now we can start writing our React app here in the JavaScript section. So why don't we do that? Let's create a React component so that we have a reusable custom HTML element we can use instead of repeating this HTML code here on the left. In its most basic form, and you're going to learn about a different form in this course too, in its most basic form, a React component is just a function. So we can create a new function and maybe name this person. Make sure it starts with a capital P. This is required to use it correctly with React. This person component is a normal function, but it has to return the code you actually want to render to the DOM. And here React uses a special syntax, which is called JSX. I'm using parentheses here to be able to write or to return some multi-line code. And now I'm going to copy the code here from the left and paste it into my return statement here. And this certainly looks strange now. It looks like HTML in JavaScript, which wouldn't work normally. And it wouldn't if we hadn't added Babel here as a preprocessor. 
Babel, if configured correctly, which it automatically is here, allows us to use this special syntax, which looks like HTML, but which isn't. And I will dive deeper into that syntax in the next course modules. It's called JSX and it's just syntactical sugar. Behind the scenes, this gets compiled to normal JavaScript code. We can use it here though, to have an easier time writing what we actually want to render. Fine, so now we got that function and I said that this is a React component, but of course, right now it's just a function. To turn this into a React component, we actually have to use React to render it to the screen. So I'll get rid of my person here on the left and instead I'll add a new div here and I'll give it an ID of let's say P1. You can choose any ID you want though. Now the React package we imported is responsible for correctly parsing this code here, this JSX code. The other package we imported was React DOM, if you remember. You can always check here on the gear icon, React DOM. This actually exposes an object, React DOM, written like that, with DOM all being capital characters, which has a render method. This method allows us to render a JavaScript function as a component to the real DOM. And that treat it as a component part is exactly what React takes care about. We can then render this function, but not by referencing it like this, but by actually turning it into a HTML element. Again, behind the scenes using this JSX syntax, which is understood by React. So I write this as my custom self-closing HTML element and render then takes another argument where I specify where to render this. And there I reach out to the document and I can use the query selector, so normal JavaScript code, to select any element with the ID P1. And that again is normal JavaScript code, the normal query selector. With that, I'm telling React that I want to render this function, the person component, in this place here on the left. And it does. Now the styling is lost because class actually is a keyword in JavaScript. So React turns this into class name. And that's the best proof that this looks like HTML but isn't. It uses a custom syntax which in 99% of the cases is like HTML, but behind the scenes it's transformed to JavaScript. And now you see we have our person class here again, Max, treated as a custom component, which we can also verify by the fact that our inline block styling here is kind of ignored because we're wrapping this in a custom element which is treated as a block statement. Now I'll dive into styling in this course. For now, let's just be happy that we got our component rendered here. It's not really reusable though. If I had a second hook in my HTML file here, in my HTML part, let's say with ID P2, and I wanted to render a different component, a different person, I would have to hard code the values into that and actually create a new component. The great thing about React and why components are so awesome and save us a lot of time is that we can configure them dynamically as we need them. So here what I'll do is I'll actually add an argument to this person function, which I'll name props. You can choose any name you want, but the concept I'm using here is called props. React automatically gives me an argument in that function I turned into a component with this syntax down here with the person, JSX code. And prop simply contains all the attributes I add to my own component. So I could add name max and age, let's say 28 like this. If I do this, now we can output this in our person component we just need to dynamically access this props element, this props argument. We output dynamic content in React with curly braces, opening and closing, and only one pair, no double curly braces, only one pair of curly braces. And there we reach out to props and then dot name to get this name attribute I passed and props age to output that age property I passed, so props age. And now we're using the properties the attributes we're passing to our own component. And that's pretty cool because now if we 
repeat this react dom render call here for p2 so make sure to exchange this in the second query selector we can pass different props to that component like menu and 29 and now both components use the same base as you can see they use the same function which is turned into a component by react but we're really taking advantage of the component concept because we only wrote the HTML code once and now we can reuse it over and over again. And I bet you can see the potential of this. In very big applications, you can compose the entire application of reusable pieces. And this component isn't even using any logic. It doesn't listen to clicks or stuff like that. In apps such as the app we build in this course, we will of course do that. We will append our own logic to our components. And then we have small, reusable, maintainable, and easy to manage pieces with their own logic contained in them, which we can use anywhere to build amazing applications. That's the idea behind React, and that is why it's so great, and why this component concept is so great. Now, let me do one more thing though. Right now, I'm calling React DOM render twice. There's nothing wrong with that. But actually, we can also do this a bit differently. We could have one div here in the HTML part, which has an idea of app or root. Doesn't matter, any idea of your choice. Now I'll get rid of the second React DOM render call and I will add a variable here. This variable, I'll name app, but this name is also up to you. But this variable also will hold some JSX code. And I'm just wrapping this in parentheses so that I can write this code over multiple lines. Now here, what I can do is, I can now output my person component as I did before. We have to wrap it with a div though, because JSX has the requirement of only having one root element. So adjacent elements are not allowed. I will also talk about this in the course though. There are ways around this limitation. So now I added two person component usages to my app variable here. And now I simply mount the app variable in the place of this element with the ID app, which I select by adjusting my query selector. And now you see, I got the two elements now next to each other because now they're rendered in the same hook, in the same element, so to say, in the same div. And this method of only having one hook one React DOM render call, and then creating an app there with nested components is the far more popular way of creating React apps. It is the way I will use in this course. And in the next lectures, I will talk about this versus the alternative with multiple React DOM render calls. But be aware, this is the way you'll see far more often. With this approach, you create so-called single page applications. Now, this is our first React app. Now let's dive deeper into React and let's continue with the course and really get started with React. So we already got our hands dirty and we saw how we build a React app. Now this already answers a bit why we might want to use React. There's also more, there are more reasons why we want to use React. React helps us with a problem we'll encounter with normal JavaScript. The UI state becomes difficult to manage. In bigger JavaScript applications, you have to manually target elements in your DOM and if you then change the structure of your HTML code, chances are you need to change the way you targeted your elements because you used query selector. Or even if you use jQuery, traversing the DOM is easier but it's still always something you have to keep in mind. And if you got more complex web apps where you dynamically add and remove elements, this quickly can become cumbersome. In our course project, we build an app which is highly dynamic, where we are able to build a burger and dynamically add and remove ingredients. If you write this with normal JavaScript code, it's going to be a nightmare. So React helps us by making this whole UI state management a non-issue. It allows us to focus on our business logic instead of keeping our application from exploding. And additionally, React is maintained by a big community. So chances are the React code is written better than we could have ever written it. 
So therefore it's highly efficient and fast. And the bigger your application gets, the more this matters too. And finally, React features a huge ecosystem and an extremely active community, which means that there's a great chance that for a given problem you face, you'll find a solution or an extra package you can add to fix it. All these are reasons why React is awesome and why you definitely should consider it for your next project and why you made the right choice to start with this course. Now there's not just React, there are also alternatives. React of course is what we'll cover in this course, but there also is Angular and there would be Vue.js. And there are others like Backbone or Ember, but Angular and Vue are the most popular alternatives. And I can only recommend diving into these two to really pick your favorite. I also got courses on them if you are interested. All three of them are great at creating highly scalable web applications that look and feel good to the user. Not so much an alternative is jQuery. You might think it is one, but jQuery is really only about traversing the DOM and targeting elements in the DOM. Now as you saw in our example, React is about just declaring what you see and focusing on the logic instead on focusing on the how. And therefore, React, Angular and Vue allow you to create more powerful applications because you can focus on the logic and your business model and not so much on the technical side of actually reaching that element you wanted to change. When we talk about React or also about Angular and Vue as a side note, we also have to keep in mind that we can essentially build two kinds of web applications with all these libraries and frameworks. We can build a single page application or a multi-page application. Now what's the difference? In a single page application, we only get back one single HTML file by the server. And we get back this file at the first time the user visits the page. So the first time the user visits example.com. Thereafter, everything is managed with JavaScript with React. The entire page consists of components which are rendered and handled by JavaScript. On the other hand, in a multi-page application, we get back multiple HTML pages where each page has the content for a given route, a given URL we visited. For example.com and example.com slash users, we get back two different pages, that's important. Now on multi-page applications, we might also use React, but only to create little widgets, so to say. So individually contained components we dump into that page, but not the entire page is managed by React. We also see this on some pages, but the more popular approach these days is the single page application approach, because if you manage the entire page with JavaScript, you never have to go back to the server and reload the page. And that is an amazing user experience because everything happens instantly. And even if the user needs to wait, you're showing a spinner or you're still presenting a reactive web app. You're not just showing a loading page where the user can't do anything. So in single page applications, our page is built up with components and every component is a React component. And the entire page also is managed by a root React component and is just under React's control. In the multi-page application, on the other hand, we also could split up our app into theoretical components, but actually a lot of the page is just going to be normal HTML and CSS code and some widgets we dump in, like an image gallery or something like that, is managed by React. So the entire page is not under React's control. The individual widgets don't know of each other's existence. Therefore, in the single application case, which is the case we'll cover in this course, we typically only have one React DOM render call. This method you saw in the previous lectures where we created our first app. Now we only need one because we have one root app component there which is mounted to the DOM which hosts all other React components. In the multi-page application, we would typically call React DOM render more often to render our different components in different places of the app. You saw that React DOM render allows you to pick a place in your HTML code where you want to render your app. 
And therefore, you have these widgets which don't know of each other's existence. Now you can build such an application too, and the React code you write won't differ, so this course actually covers both. But I will focus on the single page application case, since that also allows us to use some libraries like React Router and is the most popular way of creating web apps these days and also the approach I can only recommend to you. So now that we had a look at the basics of React and what React is about, let me explain what this course is about and what we're going to cover in this course. We're almost done getting started. Only a couple of more words I want to spend on how you get the most out of this course and then we'll be leaving this module. Thereafter, you'll actually find an optional second module. In this optional module, I will walk you through the most important next generation JavaScript features we're going to use in this course. When writing React applications, you typically use quite a lot of these next gen features like arrow functions or classes. You do this because this allows you to write cleaner React code and it's the de facto standard to use all these features. If you already feel comfortable using next generation JavaScript features, so if you already know ES6 and so on, then you can skip the next module. And I will mention this there too. Otherwise, you get a nice module where I'll ensure that we're all on the same page and that you got solid fundamentals about all these features we're about to use. And you can always go back to that module if you later in the course encounter something that looks strange or new to you. After this optional module, the real second module is the module where we dive into the React basics. That's of course a super important module. You will learn how you can create React components, that there is more than one way of doing so, and how you can communicate between components, how a React application is generally built. This section also includes things like how can we output lists or how can we render some content conditionally. Thereafter, it's time to dive into debugging because we all make mistakes. You will write code that fails. That's natural, that happens to everyone. It's super important that you then know how to recover, how to debug your application, how to find that error that makes your program crash. We'll have a look at this in this debugging module. After debugging, we'll dive into styling. How can we style our React components and how can we make sure that the styling we apply to a component only gets applied to that component and not to other components as well? We'll take a look at that in this module. Thereafter, we'll dive deeper into components. We'll already have learned a lot about them, but here we will learn which lifecycle they follow. We will learn how we can cleverly control whether React should check for updates of a component or not, and much more. So that is truly an important module, which will make sure that you understand the internals of React and that you got the tools you need for bigger or more advanced React applications. After that, you will have learned a lot about components, but we're far from being done. We'll then dive into HTTP requests. How can we connect our React application to the outside world? How can we fetch data from a server or send it to that server? How can we do all of that in a single page or also in a multi-page application with asynchronous HTTP requests, AJAX? That is what we'll have a look at in this module. And thereafter, we'll dive into routing. Routing is a core feature when building single page applications. Because with routing, we can actually handle different URLs, like slash user and slash products, and render different pages, even though technically we only have one HTML page and we simply parse the URL with JavaScript and re-render the parts of the DOM that need to be re-rendered to display a new page. That sounds very complex and that is why we will use a package for this. Routing is a super important and key module of this course, therefore. Now, one important note at this point, all these concepts are always taught in theory and with tiny demo projects. We will also have an overarching course project, the Burger Builder, and we will regularly go back to that project 
and apply the features you learned in the previous module to the course project. So we will start by planning and creating it, then we will use advanced component concepts, we will apply styling, and we will also apply routing there, so that we can gradually see our project become better and better, and so that you always have a great way of seeing all these things, not just in theory or in tiny demo projects, but in a real project. So the things I mentioned here are only the overarching topics. This course actually has more modules because we have all these in-between practice oriented modules. Back to the outline here though. After routing, we'll dive into forms and validation. In almost any web application you build, you need to fetch user input and in this module I will show you how to do this in a dynamic way and how to also validate user input. And thereafter it's time for Redux, Redux and more Redux. We'll dive deeply into Redux, which is an independent third-party library, but which of course is used in many React projects. We'll start at the basics, we'll learn why we might want to use Redux, and then we will learn more advanced use cases like using asynchronous actions in Redux and way more. This is an important module and I can't wait to dive into this and then also apply it to the course project together with you. After Redux, we'll dive into authentication. Probably every web application has some sort of authentication, allowing users to sign up and sign in. Here, I will show you how to implement this. I will always, as in all these modules, focus on the client side, so on the React side and not on the server side. But of course, I will explain how to implement authentication so that it works with any backend that supports this kind of authentication. We'll of course also apply this to the course project. After authentication, we'll dive into testing. Only an introduction to be honest, because testing is enough content or you can create enough content about testing to fill an entire course. But I want to introduce you to how you test React applications, which tools you use and how to think about testing React apps. After testing, we'll of course also learn how to deploy a React application, so how to really ship it to a real server. And thereafter, I got loads of bonus content. For example, a whole module about animating React applications, possible next steps where you could dive into after finishing this module, a module about Next.js, which is basically a library building up on React and making server-side rendered applications a breeze, a module where we will build our own workflow, our own project from scratch with Webpack and a couple of build tools, and way more. So a lot of content in this course, it has the length it has for a reason in the end, and I can't wait to dive into it together with you. So why don't we do that and just start with the course. Now that we had a look at what React is and why we might want to use it, as well as now that we built our first React app, Let's dive into all the core React concepts and the base syntax of React. In this module, we'll have a look at what it takes to build a real React app. And with that, of course, I also mean locally on our machine and not on CodePen. And you will learn which core features React offers and how you use them. So let's dive right into that. And let's learn how we set up a local React project on our machine. So we want to set up a local React project. With local, I mean, we don't use CodePen, but instead we will have a project on our machine where we can work in with our own IDE or editor. This of course is the way we want to work with React. We want to have it on our machine. We have more features available there. It's more convenient than using some web editor. And CodePen, which we used before, or JSBin, which we used in the optional second module, are really more playgrounds than real work environments for real projects. So we will set up a local project and React is actually more than just importing the two files we imported in CodePen. We need a more elaborate workflow for real projects. And this is recommended for both single page and multi-page applications. The question of course is why do we need a more complex workflow and how do we then achieve it? Let me start with the why. We, when building a real app, we want to actually optimize our code. 
We didn't care about this in the demo project in the first course module on CodePen, but for a big React application, we want to ship code that is as small as possible and as optimized as possible, obviously, because that increases the performance of our app. Additionally, and that is super important, we want to use these next generation JavaScript features I taught you about in the last optional module. Now, we want to use that because it makes our life as a developer much easier. And it's the de facto standard for React apps to use all these next gen features. Because the code is leaner, easier to read, faster, less error prone and many other reasons. So you should really use these features. It's not just something nice optional. I strongly recommend using these features. It is considered the best practice and it is what I teach you in this course because obviously I want to teach you best practices. So we want to use next generation JavaScript features to have an easier time to write less error prone code. And with all that, we need a workflow that supports these features. Even on CodePen, we implicitly did this. Remember that preprocessor dropdown where we switched to Babel? That behind the scenes unlocked a couple of build tools that would parse our code and support JSX, this HTML in JavaScript syntax, for example. So we want to use these next gen features. Essentially, we want to be able to write ES6 or above code and still ship code in the end that runs on as many browsers as possible. And not that many browsers support all these next gen features. That is why we need a build workflow that actually compiles these features. Finally, in the end, we want to be more productive. This includes next generation JavaScript features, which often allow us to write more condensed code but it also includes things like CSS auto prefixing. You might know that CSS prefixes are a thing to achieve the broadest possible browser support for CSS features. Now manually adding these prefixes is quite annoying, so automatically adding them is nice. Or consider linting, so a tool which actually warns you if you are writing suboptimal code. That would be nice to have too. Not strictly required, but a nice feature. And all these things should be part of a build workflow. Now to implement them there, we need a couple of tools that actually let them run over our code to either warn us in the case of linting or to compile the code to code that runs on as many browsers as possible whilst we as a developer are writing very modern code that would on its own not run on that many browsers. So that's the why, a couple of reasons why writing this kind of code is desirable and why we need a more complex build workflow that actually allows us to write this code that actually optimizes the code for us. And for that, the how of course is relevant. How do we achieve such a workflow? We first of all need a dependency management tool. Dependencies are simply third party libraries, third party JavaScript packages. React for example is a dependency, React DOM is a dependency. And also all the build tools we will need in the end are dependencies. So the compiler for next gen JavaScript to current gen JavaScript, that is a dependency. And we will use NPM here. Yarn would be another tool you could use, but we will use NPM Nodes Package Manager, a tool which just allows us to manage packages and which is the de facto standard for managing dependencies also on front end projects. Besides that dependency management tool, we need a bundler because we want to write modular code and split it up over multiple files so that each file has a clear task, a clear focus, and therefore it's easier for us to maintain and manage. But then we want to make sure that all this code gets bundled into a couple of files in the end when we ship it because browsers don't even support split up files older browsers at least don't do. And it might also, even if they did support it, not be that optimal to make thousands of requests to all these tiny focused files. So we want to have that bundler and we will use Webpack, which is the de facto standard for bundling these days. The cool thing about Webpack is it doesn't just bundle files, it also allows us to apply a couple of other build steps before it does this bundling. For example, the mentioned compilation of next gen JavaScript. That requires another tool, Babel. We need a compiler that does this JavaScript 
compilation, which means translation from modern features to workarounds that also work on older browsers. And we will use Babel plus presets, which can be hooked into the Webpack configuration so that they are part of this bundling and optimization process. And finally, in the end, we want to use a development server to test our app locally on our machine. Development server is a web server, but one running on our machine. We could open a HTML file by double clicking on it, but this would use the file protocol and would not correctly emulate the app running as it runs on a web server. So we need a web server and we can of course run one on our local machine. The server is then only accessible by us, but that's all we need as a developer. And there we can really see the app run as it will run in the end on a real server. We need all these things and it sounds like that's super complex to set up. The good thing is it's not. I will present you a tool that will create a project supporting all these things out of the box with zero configuration in the next lectures. We will install this tool together and it is a tool created by the React team and community and the officially recommended way of creating new React apps. Because that's the general theme of this course, I will teach you things in the best practice and recommended way. So, all of the setup is quite easy. And as a side note, if you still want to dive into how this works behind the scenes and you want to set this up from scratch, I also got a module for that towards the end of the course, where we will build a React app, a React project from scratch. Now with that, you know what we need and how. Now let's dive into that tool I mentioned and let's learn how we actually get started with a new React project supporting all these features. In the last lecture, I highlighted why we want to set up a project which gives us some additional features which make our life as a developer easier. Now, as I also mentioned, there is a tool which creates such a project for us. It's called Create React App and you can simply Google for it to find a link to its official GitHub repository. As I said, it's maintained by basically Facebook or a community around Facebook. So it's the officially recommended tool for creating React projects. On that GitHub page, you will find installation instructions and a detailed explanation about what it does and how it works. Feel free to read through that, but of course you're also going to learn all about that throughout this course. So let's start with the installation. We install it globally with NPM. And NPM is simply Node's Package Manager a tool you automatically get when installing Node.js, which makes it easy to manage third-party packages, other JavaScript packages in the end, and create React App is just such a package. To use NPM, you need to install Node.js, which you can download and install from nodejs.org. Now, there you should pick the latest version, 8.5 in my case here, but if you're facing any issues with that, also try out version 6.11 or whatever the long-term support version is in your case when you're viewing this page. Now, no worries. We're not going to write any Node.js code here. You don't need to know Node.js. We only need it to use its package manager and also for this development server, which will be spun up for us automatically. So simply click these buttons, download Node.js and it will spin up an uh, installer through which you can walk. Once you did finish the installation, you should be able to run the npm command here on your machine. So let's do this together in the next step. To install create react app through npm, you should go into the terminal or command prompt of your machine. And there you can now run npm install. This is available since we installed node. Then create react app, one word with dashes between the sub words, and then dash g. This flag at the end installs it globally on our machine so that we can run it anywhere on the machine, which of course is what we want to do because we want to be able to create new react projects wherever we want. Now on Mac and Linux, you might need to add a sudo in front of all of that to get the right permissions of running this command. And if you do add it, you're probably prompted for your password too. 
Now, once you did enter it, and again, this is not required on Windows, you will install Create React App on your machine. Once this is finished, you can start creating new React projects with it. The command can also be found on this GitHub page I showed you earlier here, but we'll of course run it together. You simply run Create React App, so the package name in the end, and then the name of the app. This will be the name of the folder which gets created where the default configuration and a lot of starting files will be placed in. I will name it React Complete Guide, but you can name it whatever you want. Hit enter and this will automatically create the folder and install all the dependencies it needs. As you can see here already, that is React itself, React DOM to access the DOM and React Scripts, which is a package bundling all these different tools I was referring to on the slide in the last lecture. Once this setup finished, you can navigate into this newly created folder with CD and then the name of the project you chose, in my case, React Complete Guide. And in there, simply run npm start. Now for me, it's showing yarn start and all these yarn commands because I have yarn installed, an alternative to npm, but you don't need that. You can just run npm start. And this will now spin up a development server and open a new page already, this page here. This is the starting page this project gives you. It is basically the starting point. We will start editing it later on. And you should always keep this process. You started with npm start running. This is the development server I was referring to, which loads your application on the browser, simulates it to run as on a real web page, and reloads the page whenever you change the code. You can also find the address where it's serving it here in the terminal. So always keep this process running if you're working on your application. If you want to close it, you can always do this with Control C, but then you will not be able to visit this page here again. Now with that, we got our project set up. Let's now have a look at what's inside there and what was created for us in the next lecture. In the last lecture, we created our project with Create React App. And as I mentioned, make sure that npm start this process is running whenever you're working on your code. I now opened the folder which was created with Microsoft Visual Studio Code. This is the IDE I'm going to use throughout the course, but you can use any IDE or editor you want to use. For example, also WebStorm would be an alternative or Sublime or Atom or any other editor you like. Now here I installed a theme and some extensions and you can find the exact configuration I'm using here described in a PDF document attached to this video, just in case you want to use the same, but feel free to use your favorite setup. Whatever the theme and setup you use, you will have the same amount of files and folders in your project. So let's now walk through all the files and folders we have here. On the root level, we get a couple of configuration files. These log files here can basically be ignored. They're just locking in the versions of the dependencies we're using. The general dependencies our project has, are defined in the package.json file. And there you can see we have three dependencies in this project. And this was all created by create react app. As you can see, we obviously import react. Here I'm using a release candidate version of react 16. At the point of time you're viewing this, this should be released. React DOM, it's the same. And React Scripts, as I mentioned, is a package offering all this build workflow, this development server, the next generation JavaScript feature support, and all these things we're using in this project. In the package.json file, there are also a couple of scripts defined. You can run the scripts with npm run and then the script name. The exception is start, which you can also run with npm start, the command we executed. And as you can see, it uses this React Scripts package to then also execute some start command there. That's simply a command this package makes available. And this command happens to start this development server, watch all our code, compile our code, optimize the code and do all these things. Once you're ready for deploying your app, you would run npm run build to optimize it even more, not launch a development server, but instead get your 
optimized code stored in a folder. Because right now you won't see your compiled code anywhere here. Everything happens in memory. But I'll come back to deploying the application later in the course. So let's close this package.json file for now. The node modules folder holds all the dependencies and sub-dependencies of our project. This is why we have that many. We only had React, React DOM and React Scripts, but React Scripts has a lot of other dependencies, all these little build tools which compile the code and so on. You shouldn't edit anything in the node modules folder. It's generated automatically if you run npm install in your project folder and this was automatically done by create react scripts. The public folder is more interesting. It's basically the root folder which gets served by the web server in the end, though here it only holds the files we can edit. The script files are edited in the source folder. Here we got one important file, index.html. This is a normal HTML page and it is the single page we have here. We will never add more HTML pages in this project. If you're creating a multi-page project, you would create multiple such projects here with create react app. You wouldn't add more HTML files here or you need your own workflow if you want to do that. So this is the single page where in the end our script files will get injected by that build workflow, which is why you don't see a script import here. And you can edit this file, but we won't write any HTML code here. I want to highlight this div here with the ID root. This will become important because this will be where we actually mount our React application later. And we will of course work in React. But if you need to add any imports to let's say our libraries, CSS libraries or want to add some meta tags, you can do that here in the HTML file. You could also add more HTML here, but again, you probably want to do this in React. The manifest.json file is there because create react app gives us a progressive web app out of the box, a very basic one at least, and gives us this manifest.json file where we can define some metadata about our application. Interesting for us is the source folder. Here we get a couple of files and these are actually the files we will work in. This is actually our React application. Most important for us right now, the index.js file gets access to this root element in our DOM, in our HTML file. So the element with the ID root, which of course is this div we saw in the index.html file, this one. And there, as you can see, it renders our React application with the render method. Now here it references some app object or element, which we import from an app file. The extension .js is left out because it's automatically added by our build workflow. And if we have a look at this app.js file, therefore, this is where we see our first and only React component we have in this starting project right now. Here we see some JSX and I will dive deeply into what we see here exactly in the next lectures. For now, let's remove all the content in this wrapping div and let's simply add a h1 tag here where I'll say, hi, I'm a React app Let's close it, of course, also. And then let's save it. That's always important. Don't forget to save your files. Now, since you have npm start running, this will automatically trigger a recompilation and it should automatically reload your page too, which is why you should now see, hi, I'm a React app instead of the old content. With that, we can also remove this logo.svg file because we no longer use it in our project. And now we got a bit of a leaner source folder. Now what else did create react app create for us? It gave us this app.css file, which basically defines some stylings we use in this app.js file. Though I will say that these are not scoped to this file. These are still global stylings. And I will actually remove everything but this first app class definition in that file and save it thereafter. We also get an index.css file, which also applies styles globally and which should be used for some general setup as here for the body of our application. 
The register a service worker JS file is, as the name implies, important for registering a service worker, which is generated automatically. That's related to this progressive web app we get out of the box. It will basically pre-cache our script files. We don't need to configure anything there. And the test file, well, we'll dive into testing later in the course. It basically allows us to create unit tests for the different units, for example, components in our application. This is the general setup and for the majority of this course, we'll work in app.js or other new components we create. Speaking of that, let's analyze this file, let's understand the syntax we see there. Let's get rid of that logo import because we removed the logo file now that I see it. And let's dive into JSX, what exactly that is and how we add more components to our application. In the last lecture, I walked you through the folder structure which was created by Create React App and we added it our app.js file. Let's now dive deeper into what we see here. We see a React component. As I explained, React is all about creating components, basically custom HTML elements, you could say, which you can then use to construct your application. This app component actually gets used in the index.js file where we render it into the place of this root element. And we could render a normal HTML element here too, test for example. This would work, this is now no React component. If I save this, I see this h1 tag. But of course, then we have no real React application. We're rendering a normal HTML element, but we're not rendering our own React component. Now you could of course, use multiple React DOM renders and render all the HTML code you wanna use in your app. That's not really how you create your React apps though. Typically, you render one root component, the app component, but you can name it whatever you want. One root component, in our case it is the app component, named app, and in there, you would nest all the other components your application might need. And of course, these components can then also be nested into each other. But all the way up to the top, you only have one root component. You could reach out to multiple nodes in your HTML file and mount different root components for different React apps all in the same project. That would be possible. But it's not what we do here. In the end, you can of course simply replicate what you learn in this course for multiple applications in one and the same HTML file. But let's stick to the general or typical usage of React. We have this app component, which is defined in the app.js file. Here we see one way, one of two ways of defining a React component. We create a JavaScript class with the class keyword, and then we use the extends keyword to inherit from this component object or class to be precise, which is imported up here from the React library. Actually, we import two things, React, which is the responsible or required for rendering anything, anything to the DOM. We always need to import that in a file where we define a component. And of course the component class itself. I will soon show you a different way of creating components though. Now, this class has one method, the render method. It needs to have that because React will call this method to render something to the screen. There's one important job every React component has to do. It has to return or render some HTML code which can be rendered to the DOM to the screen. You can do other things in there too, reach out to the internet, do some calculations, listen to events, whatever you need in your application, we will see all of that in that course, but you always also need to render some HTML to the DOM. This is so important to keep in mind. We then export this app class as the default export of this file. This is a ES6 feature and simply means if you import this whole file, you simply import this class because it's the default export. We do use this in the index.js file where we import app from the app file. Again, omitting this extension because it's added by our build workflow automatically for JavaScript files.
This app name here, by the way, is chosen arbitrarily, but typically you use the name of the component you also use in the file and you also use as the file name. One side note, you might also see these components with .jsx as a file extension instead of JS. The reason for this is this code here. I referred to it as HTML, which is returned, but in the end, this is not HTML. It looks like it, but it is JSX. So it is JavaScript looking a bit different. And this can be confusing at first when you're learning React. This might be one of the most confusing things actually. Important to know is this is just some syntactical sugar. It was basically invented by the React team and we can write it in our JavaScript files because of the build workflow we're using here. It will basically automatically transpile it to valid JavaScript in the end. It's not connected to the file extension you're using. It works in .js and .jsx files. And the convention nowadays is pretty much to always use .js files, which is why we do it here too. And it simply is code or a syntax we can use to write HTML in quotation marks whilst in the end not writing it. Sounds confusing. Let me show you what this actually is compiled to in the next lecture. In the last lecture, I walked you through this component and how it generally is structured. Now let's dive deeper into this JSX thing. For this, I'll comment out this block here so that it's not used anymore. And I'll return something else. I can use the react object we're importing up here and call a method on it, create element. This by the way is also the reason why we have to import react because this code here is in the end compiled to what we're writing here, even though we don't see that. Create element is a method and it takes three arguments. Actually it takes an infinite amount of arguments, but at least three. The first one is the element we want to render to the DOM. This could be a div. This can be a normal HTML element like a div. It could also be your own component if you have one available here. We don't though, because we're inside a component, we can't render that. We could render any other component we're importing, but we have no such component. The second argument is basically the configuration for this. And there we would pass a JavaScript object. This is optional. We can also pass null and we'll do this for now because I don't want to configure it. The third argument here then is any amount of children. And we could have multiple arguments separated by commas. Children means what's nested inside this div. Now in this case, we want to nest the h1 element. Let's try by adding h1. And then as another argument, let's add this text here with multiple exclamation marks. And let's escape this quotation mark here with a backslash so that we can identify that this was rendered by this create element method. Now with that, let me save this code, create element with four arguments, div, null, h1, and the text. Make sure you save the file. In Visual Studio Code, you see that it is saved if you see a cross here and no dot. And then let's go back to our application. Here we see h1, hi, I'm React App. And if we inspect this in the developer tools, in Chrome here in my case, which I strongly recommend using, you see we got a div with two text nodes inside, h1 and hi, I'm a React App. So we didn't render h1 element, we rendered text. And this is actually the default behavior. H1 here is interpreted as text. It's not rendered as an element. If we want to render another element inside the div, what we have to do is replace this code here with another call to react create element to create a new HTML element at the end. Here we now pass H1, then null as configuration, and then the text we want to render. So here, let's mix this up and say, does this work now? Now, if we save this file and we go back to the application, 
we see a h1 tag, does this work now? And we can also see this if we inspect it in the developer tools. We get a div wrapping a h1 tag. Now, what we don't see is the CSS styling getting applied because we don't see the class being added. In our JSX code, we added a CSS class with class name, not with class by the name, uh, by the way. I'll come back to why we use class name in the next lecture. So we add class name. In our create element call, we would simply not pass null as configuration, but a JavaScript object. And there we can define class name and assign any CSS classes we want to add. For example, app, the same class we're applying here. If we now save this file again, it reloads, and we now see the updated styling with the center text, and we see the CSS class being applied here on the dev too. This is super important to understand. The code we just wrote here with React create element and the nested React create element is the exact equivalent of this JSX code. And it's actually to what this code here will get compiled by one of the many build tools we get out of the box in this project. It is the reason why we need to import React even though we're not using it at all when using this syntax. Because behind the scenes we will use it once it is compiled. Of course writing the code like this with create element is really cumbersome, especially as you add and nest more and more elements. This is why we typically don't use this code but instead this code we started with. This is the reason why we use JSX, but it's super important to understand the internals and understand what this compiles to. And also most important of all, understand that whilst it does look like HTML, it isn't. This is JavaScript in the end. It gets compiled to this code. In the last lecture, I had a look at what JSX actually is, and it's so important to understand this. Now, in this lecture, I want to highlight some of the restrictions we face. For example, this class name thing here. JSX clearly looks like HTML, and it should. It should allow us to write HTML-ish code in our JavaScript files. Still, since it is in a JavaScript file, and since it is JavaScript, some words can't be used. Class, for example, which we would use in normal HTML to assign a CSS class, can't be used because it's a reserved word in JavaScript. We already use it here, by the way, to create a new class. This is why we have to use class name. All these elements we can use here, like div and h1, are actually managed or provided by the React library. We are not using the real HTML tags. React is converting them behind the scenes. And React defines the attributes, in quotation marks I should say, we can define on all these elements. And we don't have the class attribute as we have on the regular HTML element. We have the class name attribute here to add a CSS class. As you can see in our final code, this is translated to class though. It's not class name here once it has been rendered. Now, another restriction we face is that when we return something here, let's say we also want to return another heading, we actually can't do this here. Our JSX expression must have one root element. Now, with React 16, this is kind of loosened. And we will see in this course that we can actually return adjacent elements in the end. It is a typical thing and a typical best practice to wrap everything into one root element per component, though this also makes sense since you typically want to style your components and want to add the CSS class, which is responsible for styling to the root element as we do here. So typically you nest everything in one single root element you return. And if you're wondering about these parentheses here, these are simply used so that we can write the HTML. And I'm always saying HTML, but keep in mind, it's JSX, it's JavaScript. 
so that you can return this HTML code nicely structured across multiple lines without receiving errors. This is why we use the parentheses. So with that, I could add a paragraph here where I say this is really working. And let's close it too. Now with that, we see that paragraph here too. And we had a look at some of the restrictions or things to watch out when using JSX. Because again, it isn't HTML, but in most cases, it actually works just like it. We already learned a lot about the core fundamentals of React, especially this JSX thing, which is super important to get right and to understand. But I also mentioned in the first module of the course that React is all about components. You build your application with components and React is a library which makes building these components so easy. Well, right now we're only using one component. Time to change this. And for this, I'll add a new file in the source folder of our project. I'll actually even add a new folder and I'll name it person with a capital P. This is kind of the convention in React. You don't have to do that, but you give your components, the files where you create them, capital starting characters. And you describe what this component is basically there for. And here I want to render some information about a person. Inside that person folder, which is stored in the source folder, I'll create a person.js file. Again, following this convention of having a capital starting character and describing what this component is about. Now in there, I want to create a component. And we already did this. Actually, we got this out of the box in the app.js file by extending the component class from the React library. We can absolutely use this approach and it will become more important later when you also learn about state, which basically allows you to change your component at runtime, you could say. But most of the time, you should use a different form of component or of creating components, a bare function, a simple JavaScript function. Because in its simplest form, a component is just a function which returns some JSX, some HTML, you could say. Now, of course, you can create a function with the function keyword. You could name it person here with a lowercase starting character, which also is kind of a convention here. You could use a capital one though. And then you could return some JSX here. You can absolutely do that. You could also use the ES5 syntax of creating a variable, which holds a function, which in the end would result in the same but I will use ES6 in this course, which I strongly recommend doing. It is kind of the best practice when creating React projects. It gives you access to many new and modern features. Hence, I will create a variable not with the var keyword, but with the const keyword, because I don't plan on changing this variable, effectively making it a constant, and hence we should mark it as such. I'll name it person with a lowercase character. As I said, you could choose person with uppercase P, but you often see the function name being all lowercase. It should otherwise be the same name as your file name though, or as the component name you wanna use. Then I will assign a value to this variable or constant to be precise, and this should be a function. Now I could again use function here, but actually I want to use the ES6 function syntax, this arrow function syntax. So I will say equal, argument list, arrow, function body. This is just the ES6 equivalent to the function created with the function keyword. It holds some advantages, especially when it comes to the this keyword though. So I strongly recommend using this syntax. If this is brand new to you, now you know it. And in general, you might be interested in also diving into some ES6 courses or learning materials to simply learn about all the awesome features ES6 has to offer, like this one. Back to the syntax though. We effectively have a function here. And as I said, in its simplest form, a component is a function returning some JSX. So let's do that. Let's return some JSX. And we could simply return a paragraph here where I say, I'm a person. 
Now, this alone creates a valid function, which we could use as a component, but we also have to do two other things. Do you have an idea what we have to do? For one, we need to import React because keep in mind, this JSX syntax is transformed to React create element. And to be able to call this method, we need to import React with a capital R from the React package like this. So just as we do in app.js here. We don't need the component though, because here we're not using a class which extends component, instead we're creating a function. We still need to export that function though as the default of this file. Here we export this person constant which holds this function. With that let's save the file so that this dot up here disappears and we only see the cross. And now we can start using this component in other files of our project. Namely, in the only other component, our root component we have yet in the app.js file. There, I will add an import and I will import person. This name is now totally up to you, but it should be the name of your component starting with a capital character from dot slash, because it's a relative path, the person folder, so referring to this folder, which is in the same path as the app.js file, and there the person.js file, though we can omit the .js because it's added automatically by the build workflow. Now it's important that you give this a name which starts with a uppercase character. You could choose any other name, it doesn't have to be person, though it makes sense to use the name of your component, but it should have an uppercase character. Because in React, in JSX, all elements starting with lowercase characters like div or h1 are reserved for the native HTML elements. So you could create your own component which you name div with a uppercase d. And then React could use that because it wouldn't interfere with the normal div. And for the same reason, you should give your person the uppercase character so that React identifies it as a custom component. So let's use person here and we can either use an opening and closing tag like this or since we don't nest anything between, I'll come back to that in the next lectures too, you can also use a self-closing tag with slash and then the greater than sign at the end. With that if you save this file too and you now go back to your application with npm start still running in the terminal, you see I'm a person being rendered below our app component content. This is now coming from our own component and if we inspect it, we see in the end, we don't see our custom element. We just see the paragraph we're exporting in that function and that is actually how it should be. So this is now our own component getting used. Of course, using it like this is already nice, but what exactly is the benefit of creating it like this instead of simply adding the code right into the app.js file. Let's do more with this component to see that benefit in the next lecture. In the last lecture, we created our own component, the person component. The question is, what's the big advantage of this? Components are awesome because we can focus our code in each file and hence make it much more maintainable, not put everything into the app.js file which can really get crowded for bigger apps. And this component is also reusable and configurable. Now I'll come back to the configuring part. Reusing it is quite simple. We can simply copy it and paste it as often as we want, maybe three times. And by simply doing this and saving that file, we get the output multiple times and that is a super easy way of reusing it anywhere in our application. And if our application would contain more and more components, this would make it super easy to build it up with all these components and use them wherever we need to use them in our app. This is now effectively our custom HTML element. We also can configure it though. 
But before we do that, let's change something else about our React code. Because right now it's all static still. We have our custom component, but in there we still just have some static HTML text, some HTML content at the end. Now, oftentimes your templates, your JSX code should be dynamic, should output different things depending on the state of your application or on some user input. Now, we will do this a lot throughout the course, but let's lay the foundations for that in the next lecture. In the last lecture, we replicated the person component. Let's now dive into outputting some dynamic content in React. Thus far, we always hard-coded some HTML elements, and I'm always saying HTML, you know it's JSX, just because it looks like HTML, I'm saying that, and some text in between. Now let's say we wanna say, I am a person, and I am X years old, but X should actually be a random number. Now we can simply do that. We can replace X with math random to get a random number between zero and one, maybe multiply this with 30, and also use math floor to round it down. Now, if we do this and save that code, well, we see this output as a text, which makes sense. How would React know to execute this as JavaScript? After all, maybe we want to output it as a text. If we have some dynamic content in our JSX part, which we want to run as JavaScript code and not interpret as text, we have to wrap it in single curly braces. So let's wrap this in single curly braces, one in front of math floor and one after the closing parentheses. Now, if we save this, we let this reload, we see I'm zero, nine and 20 years old. And if we re reload this again, we see different values because it's random. Now, this is super important because this now shows us that we can output dynamic content as part of our JSX content. We can't define a JavaScript class in there or anything like that. We can execute one line expressions, short, simple expressions like simple calculations or function calls here. That is important by the way. I could call a function here and this function might then do more complex stuff. We'll actually see us calling functions once we add event handlers. Now that we're able to output dynamic content, why don't we take it to the next level and make our component more dynamic so that we can leave outputting some generic content like person and a random number and instead do something else, pass some configuration from the app.js file. Maybe some HTML attributes we pass to person to configure what we want to output for each usage of the person component. Now that we know how to output dynamic content, let's make our component configurable, flexible and dynamic. For normal HTML elements, we can pass attributes like class name, which we can add to any HTML attribute. Uh, input element also would have the value attribute, for example. Now for person, it would be nice if we could say name and maybe pass max, an age and maybe pass 28. And for the second usage, we maybe want to pass menu and the an age of 29. And for the third usage, we maybe want to use Stephanie and pass an age of 26. That's not my girlfriend, by the way. So if we do that, we want to output this and maybe we even want to take it further. And for menu, we also want to split this in our opening and closing tag and also output some additional information like my hobbies, which could be racing. Now with all of that in place, 
we have to change something in our person component to handle that input. Because by default, of course, if we save this and we reload the app, our output is unchanged because we're not using this information. How would we, how would React know what to do with that? Well, it actually is able to take these attributes and gives us access inside our receiving component on a object named props. Now, actually the name here is up to you, but you will receive one argument in your function, one argument which is passed into it by default by React, which is an object that with all the properties of this component. And properties means the attributes you add on your component. Now in React land, this is referred to as props, which is why I named this argument props and I strongly recommend doing so, so that everyone else understands your code too. Theoretically, you're free to name this differently though. So now that we have props, we can get access to that name and age thing. So we could say I'm, and now use single curly braces to output something dynamic. I am props name, and I am years old. Now here, I will keep the curly braces, but replace the random calculation with props age. I'm props name and I'm props years old. Let's now save this. And let's see what happens if this now reloads in our application. If it doesn't reload, reload manually. You should see I'm Max and 20 years old, Manu and Stephanie and all the ages. So now we're having the best of both worlds. We have a reusable component, which has a clearly defined template, but in there we use dynamic content, which we set from outside in the place where we actually use our component. This makes it really reusable. Think about all the possibilities which we will also explore in this course. Having an input component where you can set the type from outside. Having this person component which might be styled like a card to output dynamic or different content for the different persons. That is truly an amazing world of features we can access here. And it's one important step towards really building great and flexible components. What about the hobbies here though? Let's have a look at how we can use content which is passed not as an attribute, but between the opening and closing tags in the next lecture. In the last lecture, we learned how to use props, how to receive them as an argument and output them dynamically in our code. Now I also want to output whatever we pass between the opening and closing tag of our custom component. And this is actually super simple too. There is a special prop we can access, React gives us access to it to be precise. In the person component where we want to receive it in the end, I will wrap my paragraph in normal parentheses so that I can write this over multiple lines because I now also want to create a wrapping element, simply a div, and I want to wrap the paragraph inside of this div and also add another element after this paragraph. This other element should also be a paragraph maybe, but it should be a paragraph which outputs this part we pass in between. We can simply do that by using single curly braces to output something dynamic, accessing props, and then here the special children property. This is a reserved word. We didn't pass anything as children on our persons. We only pass name and age. Children refers to any elements, and this includes plain text as we have it here, between the opening and closing tag of our component. And you could nest complex HTML code in between too. This doesn't have to be just text. Could be an unordered list with multiple list items. Could be other React components. Anything can go between here. And these children are now output with this syntax. Of course, you don't have to wrap it in a paragraph. You can use it anywhere in your JSX code. 
And after saving this, we see my hobbies racing for menu, whereas Max and Stephanie still output the other content only because there we don't pass any children. If we inspect it, we see that an empty paragraph is rendered though. So the paragraph is there, it's just empty because props children is basically undefined as null because we have nothing between opening and closing tag. This is important to know, you can put your content into your component from outside not only by passing props like this, but if you want to pass some structured HTML content, also by placing it between the opening and closing tag and accessing it with props children. In the last lectures, we had a look at props. Props, simply an object giving us access to all the attributes we pass to our own components. Now, sometimes you don't want to get some information from outside, but you want to have it inside a component and change it from inside there too. So for example, here in our app.js file, let's say we also want to add a button which if we click it, simply switches one of the names we use here. So where we simply put a caption of switch name maybe. Well, we'll come to handling this click event in the next lectures. But first of all, we need to define these names here in a non-hard coded way. Right now it's hard coded into our JSX code and this is okay here, but if we later want to change it, we have to store it in some variable or something like that. Well, this actually is a class and a class has properties. This is not just the case in JavaScript, but in other programming languages too. You can kind of think of a property as a variable of a class. So in normal JavaScript code, you would simply write var something equals some value. This doesn't work in a class. There, you can simply write something equals some value. So a bit shorter, but in the end, the same you could say. There's one special property you can define in any component which extends component. So you can't do it in person. You can't define properties here anyways, because that's a normal function. So here you would have to use some constants or some variables. Still, what we're about to do only works in components which are created by extending component. There we can define a special property named state. Whereas props are set and passed from outside, like name and age into the person component, state is managed from inside a component. And state is only available in components which are used by extending component which is imported from React. It's not available in function components. Still, you should use function components as often as possible because you should use state with care. Because having state in all your components and manipulating it from anywhere in your app makes your app quickly unpredictable and hard to manage, especially as it grows. Of course, it doesn't mean you shouldn't use it at all though. Here it makes perfect sense. We initialize it by assigning a value. And this value is a JavaScript object. Again, this is a reserved word and we should use it if we want to manage, well, some component internal data, you should say. So now the state could have some persons. This is totally up to you. I simply create a persons property in this JavaScript object. And this will be an array. And you can set up any kind of data you want in this state object. You could set up a name property, which is some name. You can really manage whatever you want. Here, I want to manage an array of persons though. Now, this persons array, again, is an array of JavaScript objects where each object has a name, maybe max, and an age, maybe 28. A number here, not a string. Unlike down there, where we do pass a string, but the number is fine for me here. 
I also want to have another one here, name menu and age 29. And a third one, you guessed it, for Stephanie, which has an age of 26. Now, this is my state. We can now access a property like this, and that's not just true for state, but for any property, in our render method by simply outputting something dynamic with single curly braces as you learned it, and then the this keyword. This refers to the class due to our ES6 syntax we're using. And on our class, we have a render method we could call. We shouldn't do that though, React does that, but we have a state property. And as I said, you can also define your own properties, but state is a special one as you will learn over the next lectures. So here we can then access this state and on state, my person's array, there may be the first element by using index zero and then the name. So instead of hard coding it, I'm now accessing this property in this object here in the person's array on the state property. Now I'll copy this code here and replace my age with it too. There I of course want to access the age property. And I'll replicate this for menu, but here it's of course the first element, uh, the second element with index one in this array. And for the age, I'll also access element one and of course the age property. And for Stephanie, you probably guessed that index two and also for the age, index two and age property. With that, if we save this and we go back to the application, we see the button, which doesn't do anything. And we see the same output as before, this time using a property, the state property though. Now I said state would be a special property. Thus far, we don't use it in a special way though. We can change this. State can be changed and if it changes, and that's the special thing about it, and it only works on that state property, if it changes, it will lead React to re-render our DOM or to update the DOM, I should say. So if we change the name of Max here, for example, this will lead to this being re-rendered. And let me prove it to you by also showing you how to listen to events like clicking on this button. In the last lecture, we set up state and I told you that it would be special, but we don't really see that yet. All we do right now is manage our data there and then access it in our JSX code in the app.js file. Let's now handle a click on this button. We do this by adding on click. Now this is important. In normal JavaScript and normal HTML to be precise, it would be on click with a lowercase c. Now in JSX, and that is really important, it's on click with a capital C. Still, we then assign as a value the code we want to execute upon a click. And there we can use curly braces to execute some dynamic code. Now, typically you want to execute a function of your class, a so-called method there. And it is a convention to give this a name like the following, switch name handler maybe. Now the first part, switch name, it is totally up to you, but you typically use handler here to indicate that this is a method you're not actively calling, but you're assigning as an event handler. It's not required to follow this pattern though. You can name this whatever you want, of course. It is a good practice to name it like this though. So switch name handler now should be a function. Now, if we just said equal, right now it is just the same syntax as for the state property. But if we assign a function as a value here, it becomes a method basically. It still is a property you could say, but a property which holds a function which can be executed. Here I'll also use the ES6 arrow function. Keep in mind, this is just a normal function in the end. And there, I now want to edit my state. Well, before we, before we do this, let's see if we can call this successfully. 
I will say console log was clicked so that we can see something in the console once this was clicked. And I will go to my click listener and between the curly braces, I can now run this switch name handler and don't add parentheses, don't do this. This would execute it immediately once React renders this to the DOM because you execute this function with the parentheses. We only want to pass a reference and we do this by using this and then referring to that property which holds a function. Important, if you don't use the this syntax here basically where you assign a function to a property you could say, you will run into errors if you try to use this as we will soon do in this switch name handler function because this will then not refer to the class at runtime, simply to you how to this works in ES5 JavaScript. By using this ES6 syntax, we circumvent this problem, which will become important later. For now important, don't add parentheses here, just pass a reference to this function. With that, let's save this file and let's now open the console in the developer tools and click switch name. And you should see was clicked in your developer tools here. Now that's nice. Now let's also change the state. We'll do this in the next lecture. In the last lecture, we executed switch name handler upon a click. Now we want to manipulate the state upon the click. So I'll comment out this console log statement and we could simply do this state, reaching out to this state property here. And as I mentioned, this will only work when using this syntax, otherwise this here will not refer to the class and will therefore not be able to reach that state property, but here it will work. So this state persons, then maybe access person one and set the name to Maximilian, my full name. Let's save this and let's see what happens if we execute this code. We already get a warning here, but let's ignore it for now and let's click switch name. Nothing changes, we still see Max here. Well, as I said, we do get a warning about this. We shouldn't mutate, which means change, the state directly like this. React will not recognize that and will not pick up this change. So don't do this. Instead, use a special method React gives you. You also access this with this and then it's set state. We haven't defined this method, but remember that we extend component and this is made available by the React library. And the component object happens to have a set state method. This is a method which allows us to update this special state property here and it will then ensure that React gets to know about this update and updates the DOM. Set state takes an object as an argument and it will merge whatever we define here with our existing state. So if I here set persons to an updated array, it will merge this with existing data. So if we had some other state here, which is some other value, then this would not get touched even if we only update persons. Not clear what I mean? Let me show you. I'm copying persons and I'm basically adding this as a property in the object I'm about to use as my update here. So I'm saying this set state and set state takes this new object where I update my persons, where I only change the first person or maybe also let's change Stephanie, let's change their age, uh, her age to 27. Now what it will do, what React will do for us is it will look at our state and see which part of it we're overriding, we're changing persons. It will not discard our state, but it will simply merge the old state with the new one will override persons, since we clearly define a new version of persons here, but will leave our state untouched 
because we're not saying anything about it here and it will not discard it, which of course is a good thing. You don't wanna have to update everything about your state whenever you wanna change only a tiny piece about it. So with that, let's now see what happens if we save this file. If we save it now and reload the app and I click switch name, watch max and watch 26 years old down there. You see that? It's Maximilian and 27 years. Now the DOM was updated because React recognized that the state of our application changes. And this really is a special thing. There aren't many things which lead React to update the DOM. There actually only are two, changing state and what else? You could already see it in action. Props. We change state, that's nice, but keep in mind, what we actually output for each person is defined in this person component. And there we don't use state. And as I said, we can't use it there because this uses this function syntax. Here we use props. And that's the other thing React watches out for. If state changes or props changes, it basically analyzes the code it already rendered to the DOM and the code it would now render if it were to re-render everything. And then it updates the existing DOM in all the places where it needs to update it to reflect your new state and props. New state in app.js, new props in person.js. In the last lectures, we learned a lot about state and props. We learned that these are the only two things which lead React to update your DOM if something changed. Now, I also mentioned that when creating a component as a function, as we do for a person, we can't use state in there because it's just a function where we return some JSX code. Granted, we could run our code before doing that. And you often do that if you need to transform your props first or something like that. But you can't set up a state property here. You can't call this set state because it's no class extending component. The set state method is not known and we don't have methods anyways. It's no class, it's a function. And still I mentioned that you should use this function form of components as often as possible. And I will emphasize it here one more time. Why is this so important? Because these simple components, which are just functions receiving props, are very clear about what they do. They only render something to the DOM. They are dynamic because of props and you can add some additional logic prior to calling return. But, and that's super important, they don't manipulate your application state. As your application grows, you will see that this is not so unimportant. This is actually really important. Most parts of your application shouldn't change the application state. They should just render something to the DOM. Dynamic, yes, but they shouldn't allow you to change your application state. Your application state should only be changed and handled in a few selected components, also referred to as containers. App.js would be such a container. That's just another name, it is a component, but we refer to it as container because it contains some part of our application state. In our demo application, actually all of the application state. Here, we can change something about our app. And we, then we pass these changes down to, for example, the person component, but that's it. The change happens in app.js. And once we start building the course project, you will see me use this pattern. I will have a few components where the state actually lives and gets changed. And a lot of components which take some inputs and then just render something into the screen, but which won't directly manipulate the state. Still, you might have cases where maybe you also want to listen to an event in the person component or in any other component. Now, of course, you could turn this into a component which extends component so that you can define methods which you execute. But maybe you want to listen to an event here, but execute some method in app.js. 
so that you can keep that pattern of changing the name in app.js, but actually listening to the event in the Naru component. Let's have a look at how we can handle this and change the state from a Naru component in the next lecture. So let's say we want to call the switch name handler, which I recognized also changes the age, so maybe the name wasn't chosen perfectly. Let's say we want to call that not when clicking this button here, or not only when clicking this button, but also let's say when clicking any paragraph here, the paragraph which contain, contains name and age, inside a person component. Now for that in the person component, we could add on click, but now what? We can't call that handler method, it's in a different file, in a different class. Well, we can actually pass a reference to this handler as a property to our component. And this is no fancy hack. This is actually a very common pattern. I will first of all restructure this over multiple lines for all these components so that we have an easier time seeing which properties we're passing. And then let's say I don't even want to pass this for all the components, but only for this usage of it. So here, I will add a new property, which I'll name click. And the name is totally up to you. Here, I will pass a reference to this switch name handler. So basically what I also did here, this switch name handler, on the click on the button, here I'm passing it as a reference to this click property. And now we can use this click property in person.js. There, I now can simply call props click, because click is the name of the property I defined here. And this will execute this function which I pass as a reference. So if we save all the files, app.js and person.js, we should see that in our application, we can of course still click this button to change the name of Maximilian and the age of Stephanie. But if I reload again, we can also click this paragraph with menu here. You also see it changed the name and the years. This is something important to understand, an important pattern. You can pass methods also as props so that you can call a method which might change the state in a Navru component which doesn't have direct access to the state and which shouldn't have direct access to the state. It's a common pattern and it's important to know. You can pass down click handlers which allow you to change the data in the parent component, in the app component in this case for the person component. Maybe we also want to pass a value to our function. Maybe here switch name handler should receive the new name. So that here where I hard coded Maximilian as the new name, I actually set name equal to new name. Now, how do we pass that data? There are two ways of doing that. The first is that you call bind. And here you may simply bind this. This controls what this inside the function will refer to and by binding it to this here outside of the function, we're binding it to the class. Might look strange, but as a typical way of handling the this issue in JavaScript. We wouldn't have need to do that though, but we can use this syntax because I also want to pass a second argument to bind. This now is a list of arguments actually, which will be passed into our function. And here, this should be the new name. So here, this could be Maximilian, and to really see a difference, let's copy that bind code and let's also bind it down here when we pass the function as a reference to the click prop. And let's change this to max with an exclamation mark here so that we can see a difference depending on where we clicked. If we now save this with bind added and this received as an argument in the switch name handler, let's see what happens if I click switch name. I'm still changing it to Maximilian here, which makes sense because this is what I bound to, but that it works confirms that it works with receiving an argument. And if I click on the iMenu 
paragraph, you see that it changed to max with an exclamation mark. So this is a way of passing an argument. It's not the only way though. I will leave one of the two code snippets here with bind to show you how this works. I'll also show you an alternative syntax though. So I'll leave bind here where we pass it as props, but we could use this new syntax I'm showing you now also down there. This new syntax looks different. Here on on click, I actually execute an arrow function, which takes no arguments, though theoretically it would receive an event object by the way, but I won't use that here. And then simply as a function body returns this function call. Now here are a couple of things you have to understand. First of all, when using an arrow function, this implicitly adds a return keyword in front of the code which comes directly after the arrow if it's all written in one line. The alternative is to wrap this in curly braces and write the normal function body. So this gets returned. And what I return is a function call. This is why I added the parentheses. Now in an earlier lecture, I said that you shouldn't call this and that was true. But here this is not getting executed immediately. Instead, what we pass here is an anonymous function, which will be executed on a click and which then returns the result of this function getting executed, which of course simply leads to this function getting executed. This is useful because now here we can easily pass our data, Maximilian with two exclamation marks maybe. If I now save this and I click switch name, we see Maximilian with two exclamation marks. Now this is a very convenient syntax, but it can be inefficient. React can re-render certain things in your app too often. So I don't necessarily recommend using this if you don't have to. Use the bind syntax instead if you can. Still, I'll leave it here. You may use it and depending on the size of your application, you also might not feel that big of a performance hit but be aware that this can be inefficient. We covered a lot and we changed a lot of names here, but what if we actually want to change the name on our own? So let's say that in the person component here, we actually also have another element, a normal input element which is of type text, and that's it, should be self-closing. Now, whenever we type something there, we wanna use what we type here as a new name. Now, for that, we can listen to a special event on change. On change will be fired whenever the value in this input changes. And here, I then want to execute some method which I need to pass down from my app.js file. We got that switch name handler and I will leave it as it is and instead add a new handler. I'll name it name changed handler. I expect to get an event object here. We haven't used that before, but in there I still want to change the state. Now, of course, theoretically, you would want to change the state or the name of the person for which we type this. This is something we'll do later in the course once we learned how to correctly render a list of dynamic elements. So for now, I will always change the name of menu here. So Max will stay Max and Man and Stephanie should keep her age of 26 maybe even, but menu should change its name no matter in which instance of this person component I type. Again, this is something we will fix later. So here I will get an event. And as you might know for JavaScript events, this event probably has a target. The target doesn't make for a good name value though, but the target should be the input into which we typed. So it should actually also have a value property, which is the value the user entered and therefore this now makes for a good updated value for name. So event target value is what I want to assign as a new name for manual 
again for the time being, no matter into which input of which component I typed. Name changed handler is my handler. Now I need to pass this to a component to be able to access it from there. And since I only can change menu, I will only pass it to the menu person, though we could pass it to any other, of course. Here, I will simply name this changed and pass this name changed handler, following the same logic as for the click event. Inside the person, I can now access this changed property and simply call props changed here or not call it, don't add parentheses, but simply pass the reference to it. And keep in mind, this refers to the method we declared in app.js, this name changed handler. The event object will actually be passed to it automatically by React, like a normal JavaScript, where you also by default get access to the event object. With that, let's save this and let's see what happens. We got inputs below all components, but for most of them nothing happens if I type in them. For menu though, you see with every keystroke, the name updates, manual, whatever I want to type there. This is because we bound on change to this prop changed, which holds a reference to the name changed handler. And we then use this default event object to extract the target, which is the input element, and then the value of the target, which is what we entered. This shows us actually two things, how we can dynamically update something, dynamically call an event and use the things we learned before, like passing down event references or method references, I should say. But it also shows us how we can handle inputs. Now, it would also be nice if we would see the current value of the name in the input right from the start. So we basically want to set up two-way binding. When we change it, we want to propagate that change so that we can update the state. But we also want to see the current state right from the start. To do this, I can set value equal to props name. This is the name after all. And now we have our own two-way binding set up. We listen to changes call the changed method in the end, which refers to the name changed handler, which ups, updates the state, and we pass down the state to the person with name and age, and we output the name as the value of the input. This now allows us to show that value right from the start. And here I actually get a warning. This warning theoretically makes sense, because if you provide a value prop without an on change handler here, you actually run into problems because you're binding the value to a property without allowing yourself to react to changes. Hence, you would lock your input down. I can show this if I remove on change. Now you see, we still see the values, but if I type there, nothing happens. I can't type because we're not handling changes. So we always overwrite whatever we try to type with the existing name prop. If I reintroduce on change though, the error stays here, which is simply a false alarm. As you can clearly see, I can type because I am hand able to handle my changes, update my state, update my props, and hence reflect my changes in the input here too. So we got a working two-way binding and we're able to change that name dynamically now. Again, keep in mind only for manual because we haven't set up the logic for the other inputs, hence we can't type there because we can't update these names there. And that is probably why it's complaining here for these other inputs. For now, we can ignore this though. We will improve this once we have a better way of dynamically rendering a list of elements. We already learned a lot about the React basics over the last lectures. Our application still can use some extra styling, I'd say though. For example, these person components would be nice if they would look like cards and therefore be more like closed objects. Right now we can't really see the differences or we can't really see the borders between this component and the other components.
So styling components is obviously something super important. And right now there are two ways of styling we can implement. I will show you both. First of all, let's add a person.css file to our person component. And I gave this file the same name as the JavaScript file, just with a different extension. Of course, theoretically, that file name is up to you. Now, one important thing, whichever CSS code I write in here is not scoped to this person.js component. It is global CSS code. So I will define a new CSS class, which I named person with a capital P. Still, I could add this anywhere in my application since it is global. But by using my component name, I can rule out the danger of and accidentally using it somewhere else. So I will simply assign it to my div here. Class name, keep in mind, not class, class name, is person, a string person. Now down there in the CSS file, I can now change the styling. Maybe give it a width of 60% and a margin of auto to center it. Maybe also give it a border of one pixel solid EEE, a light gray, and a box shadow of zero, two pixels, three pixels, and a slightly darker gray. And let's give it a padding of 16 pixels, maybe. Finally, let's set text align to center to center all the text. If I now save this CSS file, and save the person.js file where I assign it as a class, nothing happens. Do you know why? Well, because we created our CSS class here in the CSS file, but by default, and this is maybe something you didn't know because it's not necessarily intuitive, but by default, no file is included into your project, into the code which gets created by the build workflow. You always have to import files to add them to the game. So we import the person component in our app.js file and we also import the app CSS file here. Now it might look strange to import a CSS file into a JavaScript file like this, but thanks to Webpack, which is the build tool which is in the end used by this React scripts package we're using implicitly here, thanks to Webpack, we can actually import CSS into JavaScript, though it will not really merge the two files or anything like that. It is just made aware of that CSS file and will handle that differently. We'll basically import it into our HTML file. So in person.js, I will also add an import to dot slash person CSS. And here you need the file extension. You can only omit it for JavaScript files. Now with that, you added this, you made Webpack aware of it. It will now add it to your HTML file. And hence, if you now go back, you see we have this extra styling on our components. You can also see that if you inspect your code, we have the person class here. And if you scroll all the way up to the head section here in the developer tools, you see that there we actually have these style tags which you can't find in the HTML file in the public folder. There we got no style tags in the head section, just some links to the manifest and so on. So not even to CSS files. The reason for this is that these style tags are injected dynamically by Webpack. This is the part I meant with it manages the imports you add. And this last style tag here, should actually hold your person class. And there you can also clearly see it's a normal global CSS class. You also see that automatic prefixing though, which is very convenient because it makes sure that we don't have to do that. We can write the shortest CSS code possible or needed and it will automatically prefix it to work in as many browsers as possible. So this is the style we set up. Let's maybe fine tune it a bit more by adding a top and bottom margin here. So let's maybe set this to 16 pixels so that we have some separation between our cards. Looks much better. Now we got the persons here. Now let's also style that button and let's style it differently because I mentioned that there are two ways of styling we know right now at least.
In the last lecture, I mentioned that we have different ways of styling the application. Let's style this button differently. In the app.js file, which is where we have that button, I want to style this button with something which is called inline styles. There is nothing wrong with using CSS files and classes, and this might even be the preferred way. But what you also often see in React apps is that you actually design your styles in JavaScript. How does this work? Let's go into that render function and create a new constant which I'll name style. The name is up to you. This is a JavaScript object and as you might be aware, the CSS style properties have JavaScript representations. For example, background color, camel case instead of a dash because background color like this would be an invalid JavaScript property name. You could wrap it in quotation marks to use it though. I'll use the camel case representation though. And then I assign a value, which is a string, which can be a color, for example, white. We can also set the font to inherit, to use our surrounding font. We can also set a border, not border color, just a border of one pixel, solid, and then maybe blue. And we could also add some padding, maybe eight pixels. Make sure to wrap all these values in quotation marks because we are writing JavaScript here. This have to be strings. Now I can go to the button, put on click into a new line to make this a bit easier to read and add a style property. This is actually the normal style attribute made available by JSX. And style, as you can already see, should receive a dynamic value here. I'll simply pass style here referring to this style constant, which is defined in the render method of which this return expression here is part. So I can't just use style like this. It's not a class property. It's a normal variable or actually, since we never change it, constant of this render method. Let's see if this has any effect. If we save this, we indeed see the button looks different now. We can improve this a bit more by first of all fixing this error and have one pixel of a border so that this style gets applied to and setting the cursor to pointer so that we get this pointer cursor when hovering over it. If I now save this, we see that blue border and we see that cursor again. Now it doesn't change up on hovering and actually styling that hover effect is pretty hard when using inline styles. This is one restriction already, but I got a whole module in this course where I show you some clever solutions to styling React components, which really can be something you can put a lot of thought into it. Always be aware, you can use a CSS file though, then the styles defined here are global. So if we change button here, all the buttons in our whole app will be changed. So this might not be what you want. But on the other hand, you can use the normal CSS syntax or you use inline styles as you do here, then the styling is scoped to the component or to the element you actually add it to, but you have some restrictions of not being able to leverage the full power of CSS. As I mentioned, I'll have a full module about this because there is a golden way in the middle where you can scope styles and still use all the CSS features. More about this later. For now, be aware that we got these two different ways of styling at the moment. Use inline styles as we do here whenever you want to scope the style and make sure it only applies to this single element and to none other element in your app or even in the same component. So you made it through the entire video and I hope you had a good impression of both the course and React. And I hope you learned a lot about React because even though this is only a sneak peek, some important aspects of React were already covered. Would be awesome to welcome you in the Udemy course, but if you already got everything you need, well, that's great. I hope you still stick around and I see you in future videos here on Udemy. I wish you just a great day. Bye.